the impulse to write fiction comes from a childlike desire to escape. Like, I just want to be transported out of my life into another world. That's why I read and that's why I write. A Visit from the Goon Squad. It seemed like the best title I'd ever thought of. It's very funny because it's actually been a terribly problematic title and lots of people don't like it. So I, I, my radar was a little off there in, in seizing upon its brilliance. But to me, it felt like a title with a book attached and I wanted to write that book. So I found myself waiting for the arrival of the book that would be called A Visit from the Goon Squad. And when I was working on The Keep, which is a gothic thriller, I thought, oh, maybe this is A Visit from the Goon Squad. But somehow that just didn't work with a gothic, with gothic material at all. So then when I began writing the newer one, and I was working on one of the very early chapters, there came a moment when um, a woman is visiting this overweight and dying, he thinks, uh, rock star. And he says, and I wrote this spontaneously, and was, it was one of those surprises I look for as I'm writing, time's a goon, isn't that the expression? And as soon as I wrote those words, I thought, aha, I get it now. This is a visit from the goon squad, and this is obliquely you know, what it means. It's about time. What I, what I had going in really was just a sense of a woman about to steal a wallet in a ladies' room in 2006 in a New York hotel. That's literally all I had. I didn't know who she was, why she was doing this, or I didn't even know I was working on a book. I thought I was writing a short story. But looking back, that, that time and place was the entry point into all that followed. So I was basically three chapters in by the time I even realized there was a book. At which point it was clear that it would have this very decentralized structure. So I thought, well, it's, it's a story collection. But then as time went on, that seemed like really the wrong category for it because it was clearly much more coherent than that, or I certainly wanted it to be. I didn't want it to feel piecemeal at all. I wanted it to feel like a whole thing that it accretes through parts and whose heft we become aware of over time. So I guess what I found myself thinking was, it's a book. <laughs> That's all I can really say. It's a book of fiction, and it doesn't really have a clear category. I think it's just one of those slightly slippery works that just doesn't quite fit into any of the pigeonholes that we have to work with, which are really just marketing categories anyway. It began the usual way in the bathroom of the Lassimo Hotel. Sasha was adjusting her yellow eyeshadow in the mirror when she noticed a bag on the floor beside the sink that must have belonged to the woman whose peeing she could faintly hear through the vault-like door of a toilet stall. Inside the rim of the bag, barely visible, was a wallet made of pale green leather. It was easy for Sasha to recognize looking back that the peeing woman's blind trust had provoked her. We live in a city where people will steal the hair off your head if you give them half a chance, but you leave your stuff lying in plain sight and expect it to be waiting for you when you come back? It made her want to teach the woman a lesson. But this wish only camouflaged the deeper feeling Sasha always had, that fat, tender wallet offering itself to her hand. It seemed so dull, so life as usual, to just leave it there, rather than seize the moment, accept the challenge, take the leap, Fly the coop, throw caution to the wind, live dangerously. I get it, Kaz, her therapist said, and take the fucking thing. I read on legal pads. <laughs> Not legal size, they're letter size, but I do write by hand. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, mostly having to do with the fact that I write very blind. So I don't really know, I, in fact, I have no idea what's going to happen when I write. And so I'm looking to get into a fairly intuitive, almost meditative, unconscious state, which is when all the good ideas seem to come in. If I, if I sit there thinking, and for me, staring at a computer screen is all about you know, logical thinking, really. Um, if I sit there doing that, I only have the ideas, you know, the obvious ideas. So I need to find the ones that are surprising, and writing by hand seems to be the only way I can really do that consistently.
I do have come to find myself using these sort of, or referring to very abstract or geometrical shapes that seem to express what I'm trying to do. So Look at Me has two different narratives that seem to have no connection to each other, but ultimately do in the form of a cipher-like person who has moved from one world into the other. So I guess the reason the figure eight seemed right for that is that a figure eight is two loops that are connected by a point, which is as much an absence as it is a presence. And that's kind of what this cipher-like person is. For Goon Squad, my visual image was not geometrical. It was actually sort of a tangle. And for a while, I thought I would call it entangled stories. You know, thinking about what is the genre of this, I thought, well, it's kind of, it's a tangle of stories. They're not braided. It's not as orderly as that. There's a haphazard quality to their interaction, and yet they do interact. And in a certain way, can't separate. So that was how I envisioned it, kind of as a net or a, a constellation, something like that. So yeah, so I do, it does seem that I, with The Keep, my, uh, the novel before Goon Squad, I saw it as concentric circles, actually, and with, you know, and the, the number of circles is larger than the reader realizes, which is, a, it's a very gothic convention, it's a gothic novel. The idea that, you know, there's a story inside a story, and maybe there's even a larger story that throws all of this into a different light, but we don't know it until the end. I'm working now on two new books, and uh, I don't really know what shape either one has, which is a, which is a sign of how early I am. <laughs> in the process, unfortunately. Black Box is a, a piece that I wrote actually for Twitter. In other words, I thought I'd really like to try to use Twitter for, to serialize fiction. I, well, actually, even before that, I thought I'm interested in Twitter. I'm just interested in it. So I joined and I tried tweeting a couple of times. I immediately felt that that was not going to work for me. I didn't, it didn't feel natural. It had the same problem for me as blogging or writing about myself generally, which is that I feel like I need to adopt some kind of persona, even if it's only myself in a kind of persona form. And all of that is creative and an interesting undertaking, but it doesn't interest me. It feels like kind of a waste of my time and a little bit artificial. I also think I do it sort of badly. And that became clear when then a vitamin salesperson hacked into my Twitter account. So I'd only tweeted like five times and then suddenly I started blasting vitamin ads at people. So that was really a drag. So meanwhile, I thought, okay, I think my interest in Twitter is going to result in fiction, not this other kind of communication. So I waited and watched basically until I could think of, I started to have a sense of a time and place whose exploration could occur in these very short units. And that happened when I found myself thinking about a woman working undercover in the south of France as a kind of spy. And I suddenly had a thought of, you know, what if, what if the action is not described directly, but described in the form of lessons? So we only find out what she learns from each thing that happens, not what actually happens. What would that be like? So I got a Japanese notebook with eight rectangles on every page, and I wrote it by hand. It was very long, and it took forever to kind of bring it into any sort of manageable form and to modulate the voice and try to make sure all the things I was trying to do would happen. Then came the question of, okay, now what do I do with this? So I went to the New Yorker, not telling them about the tweeting part. And they were interested in it, requested a rewrite, which I did, and very good suggestions from Deborah Treesman, the fiction editor. Only when we were done with all that did I say, also, there's the thing I really want you to do, which is tweet it. And she was very game. I mean, they really, they, they were so... I thought they were in a way kind of brave because if it had gone horribly, I would have looked dumb, yes, but I think it would have been worse for them. I mean, they are, you know, a bastion, a, a long-standing stalwart in, the, in, the, in fiction publication. And so trying to look trendy or the danger of looking that way, I think was greater for them than for me. I mean, I'd already writ written in PowerPoint. People knew I was nuts, but <laughs> they might have expected better from The New Yorker. To me, a, a worthy and fun experiment, and I was so grateful to The New Yorker for being so game and, and you know, not just going along, but really taking the lead and coming up with a, a fun way to do it.
I, I can't say that I have a strong ethnic identification, but you know, I, my father's family is from the south side of Chicago. My grandfather was a cop and ultimately a, a commander who would march around with all of his men. Um, you know, he was part of the, the daily machine in Chicago. And, and when I am in that particular city, like at one point my uncle Robert Egan ran for a judge there, and he had all these posters that said Egan. And we went, we were there on St. Patrick's Day. My oldest son was one. And, um, and we, we marched in the South Side Parade. And we, um, there was some sort of party with a lot of white haired guys who looked a lot like my grandfather. And I really had this very rare for me sense of, of ethnic identification, of really feeling like this is actually what I come from. I really belong here. And it, whatever belonging means exactly. So um, I think it, it, it is meaningful somehow. I went to Ireland for the first time last summer. We, we took our kids. It was fantastic. I mean, I, I truly loved it. And I did feel a, a real connection to the country. I felt like this is where a lot of my ancestors came from. It, it was clear. Um, so, so I think that, you know, having known for a long time that I wanted to be a writer, the, the literature of that place may have had a special meaning for me. It's not something I think about all the time or every day, but it's very connected to my father, who was who wanted to be a priest initially. Um, you know, he was a cop son, but he was the smart boy, and you know, had a little trouble with the celibacy issue, <laughs> so ultimately became a lawyer. Um, but you know, he was very, very devout. His marriage to my mother was actually annulled when I was two. She was Protestant, and he eventually he was able to remarry because of that. And I have three siblings um, who are his children from his second marriage. But, you know, I adored him. He remained in Chicago and I moved with my mother and stepfather to San Francisco. Whenever I was in Chicago, I would go to church with him. And so for me, the sense of being Irish American is bound up with him, my, my love for him, but also kind of missing of him because I didn't grow up with him. And, and, you know, and even Catholicism is very intertwined with a sense of that being the faith that, he, that mattered so much to him. So it's a little bit hard, and maybe it always is with these questions of ethnic identification, to separate that feeling from just the, one's love of one's parents and, and other relatives and, and feeling connected to what mattered to them. I also think Ireland, and I felt this very much when I was there, it's such a, a country of storytelling. I mean, it's not just that great writers have come out of Ireland, and not just great, but really, I mean, in the case of Joyce, someone who changed the way we think about writing and what it can do, but the fact that the, the place itself, and I felt this there as well as in the Irish American community in Chicago that my dad came from, there's just such a love of storytelling and entertainment. like just make it happen for me. Come on, start talking, like go. There's a, a celebration of that. And so I guess in a way, my Irish Americanness feels connected to my identity as a writer because I, I do feel that is a value. I mean, I didn't see much of my father growing up, but I always remember that what he just wanted me to talk. Like he just asked me questions about what I was doing and he, it was worth my while to make an anecdote amusing for him because he just loved it. He appreciated it so much. And so I, I guess it, it all feels bound together somehow. One of the things that I wanted to describe, which is my first visit to the Mediterranean, and Irish people, when they get ready to go into the sea, you go down with your bathing trunks in a bag, you know, and then you have to get into them on the beach standing up and it's the most ungainly thing you're holding a towel here you're trying to get all your stuff off and then you're trying to get these things on without anybody seeing your private parts well people in the mediterranean don't do this they come right they do that at home and they arrive down all ready and they look elegant and gorgeous and so irish people watching this think there really is a difference between us and them so if you've got an Ital if you're an irish girl and you've got an italian boyfriend and it's Coney Island, and it's 1951 or 52. There's a difference between you and him over skin tone, over how you feel about undressing, how you feel about your body. All of those things I thought were really, would be really fun to dramatize. She's already packed one case and hoped as she went over its contents in her mind that she would not have to open it again. It struck her on one of those nights as she lay awake that the next time she would open that suitcase, 
we would be in a different room, in a different country. And then the thought came unbidden into her mind that she would be happier if it were opened by another person who could keep the clothes and shoes and wear them every day. She would prefer to stay at home, sleep in this room, live in this house, do without the clothes and shoes. The arrangements being made, all the bustle and talk would be better if it were for someone else, she thought, someone like her, someone the same age and size who maybe even looked the same as she did, as long as she, the person who was thinking now, could wake in this bed every morning and move as the day went on in these familiar streets and come home to the kitchen to her mother and Rose. Just as the United States is a country made up of immigrants, Ireland is a country made up of people who left. So there's a silence surrounding all of that, an emptiness. People think it's a history of the struggle for freedom. But if you look at every family, somebody went, two people went, three people went. And that mattered in a way much more than the effort to become an independent country. It affected people more deeply. If you were going to England, you could always come back, say, for a funeral. You could come back for a wedding. You come back for holidays, but often when you went to America, especially say in the uh, up to the time where there was cheap air travel, people often thought they would never see you again, that that was you going. And the night before you left was called an American wake. And also there was a great difference. I was taken out of school in, in June of 1963 um, and brought to Wexford Town, which was 40 miles away, to see President Kennedy, who was coming back in triumph to County Wexford, where his ancestors were from, as President of the United States. And that gave all of us a sense, I mean, if we didn't have it before, of that if you went to America, your descendants could become this glamorous president with this glamorous wife and all the power. Whereas really, if you went to England, you could, your descendants could never become queen. You know, the, the, the relationship between Ireland and America is really very interesting, and it's not ordinary. I mean, it, it, it requires an enormous amount of detailed examination. But just there were crucial moments um, in the 1980s and the 1990s where the um, American government, with the help of people like Teddy Kennedy, like Tip O'Neill, figures like that, put immense pressure on the British government to explain something to them. The British government, in, in their density, could not understand that the Irish government wanted stability in Northern Ireland. Nothing else, no territory, no further war, no further violence, merely stability. And it took Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, using their sources of information, which were very, very good, the Irish Embassy in Washington, Ted Kennedy, Tip O'Neill, to explain to the British, could you treat with the Irish government? Could you work with the Irish government? And so the, so the American government became an agent in the creation of peace in Ireland, and this was immensely important. I was born in a small town in the southeast of Ireland called Dennis Gorthy. I think my four grandparents were also from the town, so we're sort of very much rooted in the place. The town of Enniscorthy is important because it was the last place where the rebellion of 1798 was fought on a hill called Vinegar Hill, which was um, opposite where we lived. And there are all the songs about Vinegar Hill and about the town from that rebellion. So in a town of 6,000 people, all those things are quite important in that they give you a sense of the past, but they also give you a sense of, of the present as coming from the past. So if you're a novelist, you find that material is almost too tempting sometimes to use. You leave it out, you play with it, but nonetheless it's there. When I started to read and buy books for myself, which was really by about 68 or 69, and like when I was 14 and 15, I mean, I wouldn't have bought an Irish book. I wouldn't have dreamt of buying an Irish book. You know, and I remember I won a, uh, won a prize, which was a um, book token. And I came back to school with Kafka, with uh, D.H. Lawrence, with Hemingway, with Jim Paul Sartre, with Camus. You know, in other words, that the idea of yourself will, willingly reading an Irish book, so that you, you, you were looking for things elsewhere. And I got a lot from Hemingway about style, about how much to leave out. And it affected me deeply when I was about 15 and 16. Those early novels and, and even The Movable Feast, those books of Hemingway's, really mattered to me. But I suppose you are, whether you like it or not, from the place you're from. And therefore, that idea of people having very few choices and very few chances comes up in Dubliners, say. Where in, in a story like Eveline, 
where she's going to go, she might go, she doesn't have the courage to go. That business especially of women not having the courage to do what they should do or do what they might do. Those issues are, I suppose, issues which I understand, which I, which I sort of know about. So I suppose you're mixing the two, but, but, but certainly with, with the reading, I would, have been, I would have read Hemingway before Joyce and I would have read a Kafka before Beckett. But what happened was that I came back from Barcelona where I'd been living. I came back in, um, in 1978 and I began to work in journalism. And really within a few years, someone had perhaps foolishly given me the job as editor of the main current affairs magazine in Ireland. And um, with quite a lot of editorial freedom, you know, even though I didn't own the magazine, but I was the editor. And I suppose we were involved without really knowing what we were involved in. To some extent, we were involved anyway in the attempted liberalization of Ireland, you know, where there were many restrictions imposed in one way or another by the church and the state. In other words, having got the English out, we then proceeded to make our own problems. And um, those years were years where there were battles fought on issues like abortion, contraception, divorce, homosexuality, you know, th th those sort of liberal issues in which we would have been on the liberal side. And uh, I think there's been a complete transformation in Ireland in, in attitude. And I think it was led, more than being led by, say, the gay liberation movement, it was led by the women's, the, the women's liberation movement. In other words, that women weren't going to tolerate an issue whereby their son or their daughter's sexuality was going to be a source of discrimination, you know, it was going to be grounds for discrimination. And so that on television, when those debates were being had, gay men tended to bring their mothers. And the mothers were often very fierce and, and, and very eloquent. And in fact, the law was changed by a woman minister, you know, who had her own children. And um, so, so it, it, was, it was all changed, first of all, in private, in attitudes, within families. And then the change came about more in public. I think if you start thinking about yourself at all as a, as a writer, even as a writer, or as an Irish writer, as a gay writer, as a bold writer, I think you'd really lose your mind. You start boring people badly, you know? In other words, th those labels are of no interest to you when you wake in the morning, or at any time during the day, or while you're asleep at night. In other words, they're of no use. Um, just get on with your work and stop thinking big thoughts. Think details. I'm not sure that there is an overall thing you can say about the relationship between Irish writers and the English language. I think people in Ireland write very differently to each other. I think if you put five Irish books beside each other, you could find five entirely different things going on within Ireland. And it'd be hard to put a single definition on them. I know there are Irish writers who claim that we write in a thing called Hiberno-English. Well, I don't think that. Hiberno-English being the sort of English that has, been, that has been used in Ireland and that it's almost a separate idiom. Well, I don't think that. When I say the man walked up the stairs, I think that's English. It sounds very like English to me. And there are a lot of English writers who I have real admiration for, um, figures like Evelyn Waugh or, or, or Virginia Woolf that would, that would really matter to me. So, I, so I'm not locked into, you know, um, a sort of, um, let's say, a, a, a relationship to the English language that, it, that is at, at an angle to it or that has a difficulty with it. I suppose it is important in some way or other that English came to Ireland with an army. That, you know, English came to England gradually, organically, Anglo-Saxon form, you know, fused with Latin, and suddenly this language emerged. And it emerged in a time of peace and prosperity. Well, that's not the way language came to Ireland. So that, um, and you are alert always in Ireland to the other language, to Gaelic, which, which, is, which is beneath English. And you are aware of that in rhythms, in the names of places, in certain grammatical structures. But I'm not sure how much that matters when you're working. I hate being called a storyteller. It's, it's a sort of thing that English people particularly use about Irish people. Oh, you're such marvellous storytellers, all you Irish people. You know, it's as though you come from an oral culture, a sort of primitive culture, and that you actually are not really part of the great tradition, which is the novel. As far as I'm concerned, I come out of silence as much as out of storytelling. In other words, of stories not being told of things not being said at home or anywhere else that you're saying for the first time, but you're putting structure and form on them and you are working with a considerable amount of deliberation and dare we call it artistry um, in the form called the novel. So I would like to think that I write novels um, and if someone calls me a storyteller I realise that it probably says more about them in some way or other but it certainly doesn't say anything about me. 
He had not intended to shift from where he stood, but he found that he'd come closer to her and stood alone between her group and the bar. The song, like many of the old songs, was about unrequited love, but it was different from most of them in its increasing bitterness. Soon it became a song about treachery. She'd her eyes closed as she worked on trills and long notes. At times she left half a second between lines, not to catch her breath, but to take the measure of the bar and its inhabitants, let them hear their own stillness as the song began its slow and despairing conclusion. As he started these stanzas of pure lament, his mother was staring straight at him once more. Her voice became even wilder than before, but never too dramatic or striving too much for effect. She did not take her eyes from no, as she came to the famous last verse. He in turn had worked out in his head a way of singing above her. He imagined fiercely how it could be done, how her voice would evade such accompaniment and perhaps deliberately wrong-footed. But he believed if he was ready to move a fraction more up or down as she did, that it could be managed. However, he knew to remain silent and watch her quietly as she looked into his eyes. He was aware that everyone was watching her as she sang of her love who took north from her and south from her, east from her, and west from her. And now she lowered her head again and almost spoke the last words. Her love had taken and God from her. God as well, or I'm much mistaken.